Welcome, Greek U Nation, to episode number 355 of the Fraternity Foodie Podcast. I'm your host, Mike Eilon, CEO of Greek University. I'm a speaker and an author. Our third book is out now. It's called From Letters to Leaders, Leveraging Your Fraternity or Sorority Experience to Land Your Dream Job. So go and pick up that book today on Amazon. We call these episodes the Fraternity Foodie Podcast because there is nothing like great food to bring fraternity and sorority leaders together. Fun fact, I met our next guest many, many years ago, and we've stayed in touch every so often because I knew when I first met her that somehow we would work together in the future at some point. And every once in a while, I would send her maybe like an interesting article, or I would just ask for a random Zoom meeting just to catch up. I wasn't sure how, I wasn't sure when, but sometimes you just meet somebody and it's just easy. And when you have similar passions in life, you have similar values, the conversation flows, you feel totally aligned. When that happens in life, just make sure that you take note of that and stay in touch with that person as they develop in their career. If you do that, I guarantee that your paths are gonna cross somewhere in the future and you're gonna be super happy that you invested that time getting to know each other so that way you can pick up right where you left off. Our next guest is Mary Simioli Esquire, of course. She is an organizational development leader known for DEI transformations as nexus of strategy, policy, education, and culture. She is a constant study of evolving trends and best practices with a commitment to data-infused narratives that resonate with all of your key stakeholders. She has the unique ability to guide not only executives, board members, staff, but also college students in highly matrixed environments with a focus on shared goals, operational efficiency, and also compliance. Mary is a member of the Massachusetts and Connecticut Bar. She's an experienced speaker and facilitator, and she's a certified civil rights investigator. She is prepared to engage in all of the tough conversations and trainings from compliance all the way through conduct. She's been given the gift of great mentors. She is passionate about leadership and development. And my favorite point, she is a loyal sister of Alpha Delta Pi Sorority, where the motto is, we live for each other. Welcome to the show, Mary. Thanks so much for having me, Mike. I appreciate being here. Of course, of course. So this is long overdue. I mean, you needed yes. to be on the show like episode number one. I don't know <laughs> how you escaped all the way to episode 355. I mean, how did my that new, My new lucky number, 355, <laughs> I guess. I guess so. Incredible. All right, so let's go back to the undergraduate days. You chose Quinnipiac University for your undergraduate experience. So tell our listeners, why did you choose Quinnipiac? Um, I love it. I chose Quinnipiac long before they were NCAA Division I national hockey champions, let the record reflect, although I loved my time cheering on the Bobcats, both men's and women's ice hockey while I was there. Um, but I actually transferred to Quinnipiac from another institution. So shout out to all the transfer students. I chose Quinnipiac because it felt like home. I think for a lot of students, that's what they're looking for is a place where they can go and feel like themselves. And you step on a campus and even though it's a new place for you, there's some level of familiarity. Uh, but at the same time, I just saw opportunity everywhere. Uh, I remember my admitted students day went with my parents and I just met tons of students who they wanted so many things. They wanted to do so many things. They were involved in so many things. And I just ate up how many opportunities there were everywhere. So it was a beautiful campus. It felt like me, but a newer, better version of me, kind of who, I guess, who I could be. Um, and I really liked that iteration. And so um, I chose Quinnipiac and that's where I called home for three years. And it was an awesome three years. And now I'm actually an advisor uh, for the 80 Pi chapter of Quinnipiac. So they haven't gotten rid of me quite yet. Well, they are super lucky to have you as an advisor. I don't know if they know that they have the best advisor in the country. I mean, I'm just saying. <laughs> no they might better. disagree, but it's okay. <laughs> they might disagree. So let's like, not her again. <laughs> not her again. 
<laughs> well, let's talk about it. You joined Alpha Delta Pi as an undergrad. So, I mean, what made you want to join them in particular? Was it the Woodland Violet? What, what made you want to join? <laughs> yeah, really feeling the Woodland Violet. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> no, um, what's so interesting is so I shared that I transferred. And so what the reason I maybe joined AD Pi and why I stayed in AD Pi, right, are very different. And so as a transfer student, Quinnipiac back in the day, um, used to have deferred recruitment. So their recruitment wasn't until the winter term. I just told you I picked Quinnipiac because I wanted to do all the things. I met all these awesome students that they traveled abroad. They did international service. They were president of everything and everywhere. And, you know, um, I was just so impressed and I wanted to feel like Quinnipiac was my school. And so for me, the way to do that was to jump in with both feet and get involved as quickly as possible. And one of the opportunities that arose was Alpha Delta Pi, our chapter was a new chapter establishment the same year that I transferred. So I was actually a founding, I was in the founding class of that chapter. And I said, well, if I'm new, no one, no, we're all new. No one will know that I'm new. I'm not going to miss out on any opportunities to run for office positions or leadership roles because we're all new. And all of the time and kind of connection that I missed out on with like freshman orientation or first year residence halls, I'm going to get that back. So that was my initial introduction and kind of interest to, I'm going to check out what this process is like. And I decided, you know, that this is a great opportunity, but if it's not for me, no big deal. I'll just go through recruitment. Um, come winter time. And I ended up actually falling in love with AD Pi, the leadership consultants that were on site, learning about expectations um, of the organization, their involvement with the Ronald McDonald House charities. Um, I grew up in Western Massachusetts, where there's a Ronald McDonald House in Springfield that I had volunteered at through high school. Um, and it just was one of those kind of serendipitous experiences that the convenience is what attracted me to it initially. Um, and I will give credit to my dad because he's very proud of it. He was the one that said, you know, fraternity is a great way to network and meet people. Both of my grandparents had been involved. My grandfathers had been involved in fraternal type organizations, like cultural organizations. And so my dad said, you know, this is your chance to meet meet people. And so I think you should look into it. Um, so I looked into it and then I kind of fell in love with it because of those values. And I felt like it was the first time I was with women, right? Women in the chapter that were older than me, juniors and seniors, who, when you're a sophomore, you're looking at them and idolizing them and have them on a pedestal. And they would look at me and say, you know, we're proud of you. And women who I thought were smart and pretty and funny, when I performed well in school, they were proud of me. And when I volunteered, they were proud of me. And so having such great role models really early in my college career, um, just, I think, solidified that that sisterhood space was not only what I wanted, but really what I needed to become who, like I said, I went to Quinnipiac to be that aspirational version of myself and AD Pi helped me get there. So fell in that's love a, with them. That's an incredible answer. I hope the headquarters cuts that and uses that in every <laughs> promo on why you need to join up. They have me plenty. They have me plenty. <laughs> they and know, you know it. What? And now it all makes sense to me because you were a founding sister. I mean, every founding father, every founding sister. I mean, these are people that are movers and shakers that are literally the best in the industry. Mm -hmm. I don't know what it is about being a founding sister, but I'm just telling you, these are some of the most incredible women that I've ever met. That There's something special in building mm -hmm. that from the ground up that enables you to do things that ordinary people can't do. And I will never be a founding father. Like I joined an existing chapter. I'm jealous of the experience you have. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah. No, I, I honestly, I really chalk it up to the fact that sophomores through seniors, we're all in a new member class together, learning our values, our ritual experiences all at the same time. Mm -hmm. So there wasn't this social hierarchy. There wasn't this notion of like families and lineage and all those kind of other things that are great and important, but can also distract us from sisterhood and brotherhood. Right. Like, because at the end of the day, that's what we were there for. And there wasn't so much like 80 pie politics, right, as there can be when you enter an established chapter. So the movers and shakers of the founding, someone's got to build the house, you know, it's got to be the founding member. So what a great experience that is. I mean, oh, and then yeah. you ended up working for the headquarters as a leadership consultant. Talk to our audience. What is it like working for the headquarters and being a leadership consultant? So I, I think like many other founding members was deeply impacted by the consultants that worked with my chapter as a younger chapter, as a new chapter, we had several that were on the ground with us for a long time. 
those were women that I could not have looked up to more without breaking my neck, right? Absolutely. Everything they were. And again, it's so funny looking back now because I'm like, yeah, they were 22 and I was 20, but I was like, wow, they're so wise and classy and like, oh my gosh. Um, so I was really kind of infatuated with that and wanted to emulate that. Um, and working for the sorority, it's it was a one-year experience. Most leadership consultant or you know leadership development consultant roles are one to two-year contracts. So I was only on a one-year contract, and it was one of the most formative experiences I think I will ever have in my life. Right, and it was really early, but um, I was the only member of my consulting class that was a member of a new chapter. So I was the only first year consultant that was sent to establish a new chapter. So I ended up living alone in Oklahoma for a year um, after only having lived on the East coast. Right. I thought I was at the time, I thought I was like really going away to school. I went from Massachusetts to Connecticut, like, wow, what a journey. Uh, then I'm sent right to Oklahoma. I met all new people. I met tons of folks. I traveled to probably 10 or so different chapters across the country. And I just learned to love and meet people everywhere I went, right? Like that value of connection and sisterhood is so strong. And I'm still in touch with a lot of the women that I recruited to their new chapter establishment. Um, so it was a really, it was a tough experience. It's definitely a lot of work. It's not as glamorous, I think, as I thought it was this notion of like, I'm going to be jet setting and like meeting folks. <laughs> no, you're landing in chapter, you know, your boots on the ground and chapters are struggling. Um, you know, whether it's mean girl conflict, um, whether it's low recruitment numbers, whether it's, you know, fraternity and sorority life is not as popular on that campus as it once was, and they can't recruit people into the chapter. So you're often not meeting organizations or individual members when they're feeling at their best. Um, and as someone who self-identifies as having a fixer personality, I think I was well suited for that type of job. Like, let's get in and get our hands dirty. Um, it was a ton of fun. It was really tough, but, um, I've definitely met some of the most important people in my life out of that experience. Um, I think, for leaders and a lot of the folks that you work with who are top tier leaders, who are doing all the things and checking all the boxes and showing up to the, all, the, all the events, you're fatigued and you're exhausted. And at least I felt this way. I was frustrated when I couldn't understand why other people weren't kind of falling in line or like, I'm doing so much work. Why aren't you doing this work? And so sometimes when we're thinking about our chapter experience, our organizations, brotherhood, sisterhood can feel tough and strained and frustrated and, and exhausted. Like I often tell people, um, if I was going to quit 80 pi, it would have been going into my senior year, right? Like I was done. Um, and then you're, you get a worldview of your organization, right? And you see your chapter as bigger than your home campus and you meet people who have your values and there's something, right? The ties that bind, there's something that connects you and pulls you. And so um, I'm getting married at the end of July and it's, people are laughing at me for the number, not just the number of 80 pies and other, you know, Panhellenic members that are coming who I've met over the years. But people are like, you should have a map from where everybody is from because they truly are, you know, some of the most important people in my life who have never met, never been in the same room as each other. Um, and they're from all over the place. So super thankful for not only my leadership consultant experience, but all, you know, the volunteerism that came out of it, the committees, the conferences, the other work that really led me to the people that were supposed to be in my life. But definitely shout out to the people that are like this man, my, my chapter brothers and sisters are giving me a run for my money. I'm like there's more, there's more of you out there. I promise mm -hmm. you'll yeah. be okay. Listen, that's an early experience for you, only one year, but I know I keyed in on that right away. And I'm like, this was a huge part of who Mary is today, that mm -hmm. if she didn't have that experience, it wouldn't have been able to lead to all kinds of other connections and other things. Um, so that's really, really great. And you're a member of the Massachusetts and Connecticut Bar. So what made you want to get into law? So... Um... It's all related, I promise, right? And like what you said. So when I was a consultant was during the 2012-2013 academic year. So for those folks, I'm going to pull in Title IX for a second. Title IX, the Dear Colleague Letter and Regulatory Guidance in 2011 um, had just come out, right? So there weren't new laws, but it was the first time the administration was saying colleges are responsible for sexual misconduct. And so the year that I was traveling... I was meeting students regularly at those chapters 
that were frustrated with their institution saying, you know, this is an experience that we're having that my friends are having. We're worried about our safety and no one is doing anything about it. And then I'd meet with administrators who were saying, we don't, we don't know what to do. We have no guidance, right? Like I have a PhD in math or like I'm the director of residence life. I have no training on this. We don't know what to do and we're not getting any help. And so there was a ton of frustration. And so I had always known I'd wanted to go into law since I was a kid. I think I'm one of the, I, I never changed my major. I was a political science major. I think I started saying I wanted to be a history teacher and then I wanted to be a lawyer. And kind of that was it. Um, that was the extent of my, uh, what do I want to be when I grow up? Um, what I didn't realize at the time is that law is an infinite degree that gives you an endless possibility of jobs and careers. Um, didn't really know that. So I kind of cheated, right? And I just picked a whole blanket field. But um went to law school knowing I wanted to do work with children and families, was really passionate about things like adoption, foster placement, um, child safety, advocacy, was interested in helping people. And that's kind of all I knew. And that started to get really refined through that LC year. I thought, you know, maybe do I want to go into higher education? I don't think I'm a student affairs gal. Um, they're amazing. And, you know, student affairs is such important work. But that just wasn't my strength. And so over time, that became, no, I, I think I do want to stay in the higher ed space, but I'm not committed to leaving law. Um, and then, again, this is when Title IX really started to form and change. And so my interest in going into the district attorney's office as an assistant district attorney was to learn due process procedure, investigative technique, um, which are all transferable skills. So I ended up working in the special victims unit. Um, in that space, I mostly worked with children under the age of 14, adults um, with disabilities and elderly folk. Um, but most of my cases involved kids. So I learned, um, I received trauma-informed certifications for trauma interviewing techniques. Um, I worked on a multidisciplinary team to interview child victims at the Children's Advocacy Center or the Family Advocacy advocacy center, some communities call them. Um, and so a lot of folks kind of look at my timeline and they're like, what the heck is going on here? And I'm like, I promise it makes sense because to know process, to know how to ask questions, to know how to follow procedure, to do legal research, to know um, what I had to do as a prosecutor to keep my process safe and make sure that my cases couldn't be appealed, right? I can't think of anything now and, you know, as a Title IX coordinator, I'm doing a lot of the same work. I'm not representing one side or another anymore, um, but I fully have an understanding and experience in exercising due process, right? And so when we're writing our procedures, um, I attribute it all to the knowledge I gained during that time. So I knew when I went into that role, I wasn't gonna be a lifetime prosecutor, um, but the I could not think of a better way to get the experience that would serve me um, than starting in that space. Um, and it is learning by fire, right? Like you, the day I got my bar results is the same day I was sworn in as an ADA. They threw a stack of files on your desk and they say like, go get them tiger. Like don't mess up anybody's life. And you're like, Oh, okay. Perfect. <laughs> so much. Um, so I learned a ton. Um, and I had really great mentors in that space. Um, you know, other attorneys who would, you know, take me under their wing and say, here, you know, here's how you can do this. And here's how you can do this. Or, you know, look at this motion or, you know, pay attention to this detail. And so I learned a ton, um, but I knew long-term I was going to kind of turn the wheel and get back into higher ed. Wow. Really good stuff. Now you mentioned Title IX and I know you've done a ton of Title IX work on college campuses. What exactly is Title IX for all the people who don't really know what that is? Yes, which is most folks, right, Mike? Like, right. one of the things that makes me kind of the most wild about Title IX education is that it's the only area where we expect you to be able to correlate what that office does with the name of a the section of a legal, like, function, right? So Title IX of the 1972 Educational Amendments means Section 9. We're referring very specifically to federal education law, and we talk about it in higher ed as if it's like a normal thing that students would know. Um, and the that's example that's that I always use is if you have an issue with, let's say, your dining dollars, where would you go? Dining, right? If you want to study abroad or are interested in study abroad, what office would you go to? Uh, international programs, the study abroad office. If you have a problem with your residence hall, where would you go? Residence life. Mm -hmm. um, if you 
are experience dig experiencing digital stalking, where do you go? Oh, now we have, not only do you have to know what Title IX means, but you have to be able to code the types of experiences that fall in that category. So I appreciate you asking that because we assume everybody does. And a lot of our Title IX education just has to start there. So Title IX of, like I said, the 1972 educational amendments is the federal law that prohibits discrimination on the basis of sex for educational programs and activities that relieve, that receive federal financial assistance. So we're gonna have a whole bunch of students that go, oh, that doesn't apply to us because I go to a private school. Well, if your school receives Pell Grants or federal aid or students can use FAFSA to pay for their tuition, you are receiving federal financial assistance. So I would say it covers 99% of institutions uh, in the United States. And so it prohibits discrimination in athletics, sure, that's what most folks think of, right? Because that pre-2011, that's really what it applied to. Um, but it also applies to residence halls. It applies to internships. It applies to student government. Um, and now it applies to gender-based misconduct as a blanket term. But um, by that, I mean sexual assault, stalking, dating and domestic violence. So any of those types of instances, if they were occur, what Title IX now mandates is that your college or university has to have a process to be able to respond to and support students who have had those experiences. Um, but I think when we, again, when we think about Title IX, there's kind of a population of folks, I would say my age and, and older, who almost exclusively think, oh, Title IX, like women's volleyball, go get them, right? Like they're only in the athletic space. Yeah. Because for a long time, the cases that we were seeing probably from 2000, you know, 2000 to 2011 were all sports related, right? Like think about, you know, the women's gymnastics team at Brown getting reinstated. Um, it, it was sports. So, you know, people, you bring up Title IX and people are like, Billie Jean King, battle of the sexes, baby. Oh, yeah, go get them. Um, so that's one. And then students today almost exclusively think of Title IX as sexual assault. Um, and it's everything, right? It's if you can't, if you don't get selected to serve in a lab because of your gender, that's a Title IX violation. If you, you know, if the best building on campus is a men's only residence hall and there's not enough space for women on campus, uh, that could be a Title IX violation. Um, if you are, you know, you get paid differently because of your gender, because, you know, at a work study, that's a Title IX issue. So every educational program and activity, meaning anything you went to college to do is subject to this anti-discrimination law on the basis of gender and the basis of sex, I should say. Very complete answer there. I like that. <laughs> Long-winded. Yeah, no, that's good. I mean, that's exactly what I think the students need to hear because nobody ever breaks it down. You're like, Title IX, what is that? I don't even yeah. know what that is. So you mentioned some of your training uh, in working with youth, and you mentioned utilizing trauma-informed practices. In your opinion, how can college campuses better engage with the students that are on their campus in crisis, utilizing these trauma-informed practices? I think when I talk with folks about trauma-informed practice is it's really understanding trauma and helping students understand trauma. When someone has had an experience that is traumatic, right, what, what can be deeply frustrating is that person is not able to process or understand their own emotions at the time. Or a lot of students I work with feel they're frustrated that they're so upset or they're frustrated that they can't sleep. Um, and for students and administrators, I think it's so important for us to know that the reason something is traumatic and has a traumatic impact um, is because we have no control over how our neurobiological response has framed that event, right? Every, every person has a different threshold for trauma. Two people can go through the exact same experience under the exact same conditions, and the impact of that event can be very different. So when we're working with students, we need to help normalize and frame for them your, your feelings of frustration or your inability to sleep or how much this has affected you is not incorrect. And we fully recognize and know that it's also out of your control and that's okay. And I think alleviating the frustration for students and remembering that as administrators, that our students are not intentionally behaving erratically or, you know, they're, they're uh, you know, maybe how long they're engaging with an office for services of course it's gonna be different than the next person who we connect with is, right? Because everybody is different. And so really understanding 
what the biology of trauma is and, 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 and what that means for us, I think is so important, right? We have our uh, best practices when it comes to things like interviewing, you know, having comfortable lighting and having comfortable seating and allowing for breaks. Um, and that's, it all really is important. It has a really positive affect, but if, as an employee or right as a staff member, we're engaging with other staff members or, or students, and we are not recognizing the truly biological impact of a traumatic experience. It doesn't matter what ambient lighting or snacks you have in an interview room, you're going to miss the boat on that. So I think exercising patience utilizing all the referrals that you have in your toolbox, making sure that students know these are all the things that are available to you. You know, how can we support you? Making sure that they are affirmed and understanding that, you know, your reaction to this, it's called trauma and it, it is out of your control. There's no need for you to be frustrated or upset or embarrassed because it's your body's response to this. You know, and, and I spent a lot of time talking with my students and, and, and our, you know, our staff, I work with when I train our investigators or I'm training decision makers, really spending time focusing on how important it is to understand that because it helps us rehumanize the situation. It's easy to shift trauma-informed practice into, you know, a way that you phrase things. And again, like make sure that you have seating options. Like I've worked with institutions in consulting capacities who say things like, oh, we put a beanbag chair in our interview room. So we're trauma-informed. And I'm like, oh, what the, what? what the? Please never say that to anyone ever again. So I think really, really spending time understanding that biological piece and sharing that with students because, you know, I hate to equate it to this, but it's almost like the frustrations of puberty, right? You don't understand what's going on with your body and that makes it scarier and that makes it worse. When someone has experienced trauma and if they're having panic attacks or it's experiencing symptoms of PTSD, if they're not understanding why that's happening, it can be even worse. And so taking the time both with staff and students to kind of really, really go through that neurobiological piece, right? And it's not to say you have to go to med school uh, before you're adjudicating cases, but I think when we get back to the human piece and really help people understand here, here's what's happening and here's why you might be feeling that way and it's normal and it's okay. And I know you're frustrated, but it's, it's out of your control and that's your body's natural response and it's okay. That's a totally different way to approach that. Um, and it's a different reception by that student than again, like, hi, I want to ask you about this experience you had. Also, look, we have a basket of snacks for you, right? Like <laughs> so close yet so far from what that student actually needs. So um, I think it's incredibly important and you have to take the time to really understand, again, what, what it is that we're talking about. Wow, you're a pro. There's no question in my mind. I picked up on the student frustration that you mentioned in that answer. Mm -hmm. And I feel like today students are just so frustrated when they see reports on apps like Yik Yak or other anonymous apps that are out there, but they feel from the student's mm -hmm. perspective that there's no accountability for the students who are accused. So can you please explain the Title IX um, the processes that are involved in adjudicating these um, these cases and why that's so important to follow that process. Yeah, absolutely. And something I will say in terms of the frustration is it's felt universally, right? Like I, as someone who has, I've been a decision maker, I've been a Title IX coordinator, the frustration I feel with, I have information, I can't do anything about it. That's not a positive feeling, right? And so I appreciate the frustration of students, staff feel it, administrators feel it. Um, it it's frustrating all around. But when it comes to the accountability piece, I think one of the biggest misunderstandings in the Title IX space is the difference between a report and adjudication. A report is when you notify, right? You put an institution on notice of an experience. That can be a named report, that could be an anonymous report, that could be a friend of a friend of a friend tells a teacher who's a responsible employee who then tells the Title IX coordinator, right? A report just signifies the institution has been put on notice. An adjudication under current federal law requires that we have a person who experienced the harm sign what's called a formal complaint. So, right, it's essentially the notice and consent form that allows an institution to facilitate an investigation. 
So unless there is other types of evidence or very apparent um, evidence where the Title IX coordinator themselves could sign that notice, meaning um, like let's say there was an incident of domestic violence that was caught on an institution's security camera, the Title IX coordinator might be able to sign that themselves. Um, but more often than not, these types of instances are happening behind closed doors um, with you know, few folks, if any witnesses. Um, and oftentimes instances of sexual violence are happening privately, right, with just the two folks there. I want to highlight that is not to say that it's impossible to adjudicate those cases. But if we don't have someone willing to engage in the adjudicative process, often by law, one, we're not allowed to go forward. And two, if we did, it would quickly be be turned over, right, or, or reversed or whatever that would look like. So when I talked earlier about, right, the, the need to go to court and learn about due process, all students are protected by due process if you're at a state school or what we call fundamental fairness if you're at a private school. And that means that you are entitled to know what process you are being put through if you are accused of misconduct. And that's true of everything from sexual assault to if you have a uh, candle in your residence hall, right? Or if you're you you know you're under 21 and they find a beer can during a room search, right? you are entitled to know what process is gonna be used to determine whether or not you're responsible for that misconduct. So that's piece one, like when something comes in on Yik Yak and you know, I get a screenshot sent to my office and they say, why is this person still on campus? Mm -hmm. I don't even have a basis for what the actual notion of the allegation is. Right. Who is this person? What was the experience that was had? Um, and, you know, I've been using the term since we've been talking sexual assault. I want to compare it, take it out of this context to the term hookup. Right. And nothing makes me feel older than trying to use like, hey, fellow kids, like what phrase are you using? But like if a student said to another student, oh, so and so hooked up with so and so on Saturday and you asked five different people what that meant, you would get five different answers. Mm -hmm. Right. So. Oftentimes someone will say, you know, this happened and we have to take time to understand and define those terms because from an institutional perspective, if I'm going to accuse someone of misconduct, I have to charge them with what's called specificity. They're entitled to know who made the allegation, where the alleged conduct took place, the approximate time. So it could be a specific date or a date range. Um, and they're entitled to know those facts because they're entitled to present evidence. So the ability to present evidence and witnesses, that is a right that all of our students have. And I think, you know, it's, a, it's really frustrating and really impassioned when we look at it in a sexual assault context. But when we step back, to the general student experience and remember how important due process is. Um, you know, there are institutions that for a long time, and there's been letters that have been published about it, who used the student conduct process to segregate their campuses, right? Because they could come in, knock on your door, say, pack your bags. You, you know, you've been accused of misconduct. They say, what did I do? I, we don't have to tell you. We're kicking you out or we're moving your building, right? And they used it as a tool to segregate their institutions, to keep students of color out of their institutions, to keep women out of institutions, right? And so that due process, you you being entitled to those rights is, is really essential. And that's not to say it feels good at the time. Um, and it's not to say, you know, in the long run, um, it, it, it doesn't become less frustrating, right? If you've already been victimized by someone and now you're like, and now I have to go through this really traumatic process um, or this really difficult process, but um, it's, it's so important that all of our students have that right. And it also protects folks who are victimized from being retaliated against, right? We couldn't have someone else come and make a report that they participated or acted in a way that was inappropriate or engaged in misconduct and then kick them out. So it, it's really, really important and it's really essential. And that's not to say it's not frustrating, um, but it's important and it's essential. Thank you for explaining all that. I feel like that answer can really go a long way in helping to reduce some of the frustration. It's still going to be frustrating, just like you said, Oh yeah. but hopefully it's going to reduce some of that frustration to at least know why. And I think you've explained it better than just about anybody else I've ever heard. And you're absolutely right. Uh, hooking up does mean like five different things to five different people. A hundred percent agreed there. Now, because you are a member of Alpha Delta Pi, I think you can also 
also answer this question really well, which is what is the correlation between our fraternity and sorority values and our own commitments to sexual assault prevention on campus? There, it, it's one in the same, right? Like I think when we, when I think about brotherhood and sisterhood, and when I think about fraternity and sorority life at its absolute best, fraternity houses and sorority houses should be the safest places on college campuses. If we were the people that we made promises to be, not only would those be spaces where there isn't sexual assault, which is not our current reality, but they wouldn't be spaces where there are bias incidents or discrimination or harassment, right? And again, that's not our current reality. I, I am not naive enough to know, right? I, I work at institutions and I work with institutions um, where most of the misconduct is coming out of these communities. And I think what is so frustrating about that is when we think about our organizational values or our community values, right? Brotherhood, sisterhood, respect, integrity. Respect, how respect walks and talks and treats other people. There is consent when you respect someone right? There is not domestic violence or dating violence in relationships where you respect someone. If you are a person of integrity and you act in that way and you approach and engage with other human beings in a way that is integral, there's no sexual assault, right? If, if we are able to correlate what our values, what we say they are and how we behave, then we are folks who are intervening, who are using our voice, who are being disruptors of violence. Um, and so I, I think remembering in terms of our promises for excellence that safety is a part of that. And I think what often happens in our communities is we conflate being safe with not being fun, right? And thinking about our interactions and dynamics and relationships, particularly when it comes to alcohol. Right. And I know that not all instances of sexual violence occur when one or both parties are under the influence, but many of them do. Um, you can still be a person who has fun and has a good time and really loves college and does all the things and keep you and your friends safe and treat sexual partners and romantic partners with respect. And when someone is acting in a way that they shouldn't be acting, you can say something, um, right? If, if we are living up to the expectation that we will be more excellent, which, right, all of our rituals ask us to do in one way or another, even though it's top secret, um, that's what it is, right? Like we went into a room, we promised each other we'd be more excellent or better versions of ourselves. Um, and we came out. And so to me, it's one in the same when we think about, again, integrity, respect, brotherhood, sisterhood. From a brotherhood perspective, if I value you so much and I want to keep you safe, not only do I want nothing to happen to you, I don't want you to experience any sort of physical harm, but I want to look out for you. I don't want you to get in trouble and I don't want you to physically harm someone else, right? And, and the same is true of sisterhood that, you know, if I care about you from a sisterhood perspective, I'm looking out for you. I don't, you know, if I think you're being too aggressive or I think you're being inappropriate, I'm going to disrupt that because like, sister, I care about you and I don't want you to get in trouble. Um, just as much as I want you to be physically safe and well, and I don't want harm to come to you. So um, we should be the advocates, like poster community members for safety, especially in areas like the, you know, social areas where it's often members of our community that are governing those spaces and have the social collateral to make those spaces really safe. So I think it's one and the same. It has to be. We have that social collateral. That's exactly the reason why I do what I do is because I do believe we can leverage the leadership that are embedded in today's fraternities and sororities to bring change, not just to the fraternity and sorority community, but to the entire college campus, to athletics, to the band, to everywhere. I think it's pervasive because of that social capital that they carry. So you and I are 100% are aligned. The one last thing I wanted to ask you about that I think is really important is, is that I know that there are some new regs, uh, regulations that are mm -hmm. coming down from the federal government on these Title IX policies that you talked about. So when do you expect that these new regulations are going to be ready for us to look at? Um, and what does that really mean for college campuses and the Title IX offices once they are released from the federal government? Yeah, absolutely. So uh, whenever we talk about regulations, I always 
feel a little schoolhouse rocky and want to remind folks, right, there are several different ways that laws are made. Like, I promise I won't sing or like try and rap to you or anything like that right now. But one of those, the ways that we make laws in our country is through adjudicative rulemaking, um, is through the administrative law process. Um, when that happens, what it essentially is, is a department is coming up with laws that will govern and guide either what they oversee or that department internally. And the idea of it makes a lot of sense, right? That subject matter experts that work in that specific space would be the ones to tell citizens, here's what we need, or here's what lacks regulation. Um, I have no house plants. I can't keep anything in my house besides myself alive. Um, if the Department of Agriculture called me up and said like, hey, Mayor, what do you think we need? I'd be like, I have, I have no clue. I have nothing. I have nothing for you. So yes, I trust them to make those regulations. With that comes what is called the notice and comment period. So as a part of administrative rulemaking, when new laws are being proposed, they can't be right, like swept under the rug or like snuck through at midnight. Um, they have to be published. And then the, the public has the right to comment on them. So, right, the publishing is the notice, the commenting is the commenting. Any person, entity, uh, institutional consortiums, nonprofits get to reply. And so what we are now waiting on is the final iteration. So what we got about two years ago was the proposed regulations or the laws, right, the way that we would interpret Title IX or the way that we would enforce it. Um, and there were over 200,000 comments from nonprofits, from individuals, from institutions, from, uh, you know, Title IX uh, groups, from Title IX coordinators, from students who had been victimized, who had gone through this process. So we're now just waiting because the law also requires that the governmental agency, they have to not reply individually, but they have to at least respond to every comment that is made. So when I say comment, I'm not talking about like Instagram comments or like, you know, Facebook comments when your mom goes rogue and it's like a million emojis, right? Like we're talking about legal briefs, right? Things that could be hundreds of pages long. So it's taken a long time. And so that's why we kind of don't know when they're coming. Um, for uh, all educated guests purposes, um, most folks believe they're coming in May. Could that be May 1st? Could that be the end of May? We have no idea. Um, but folks in the educational space, training space are starting to prepare for the new regulations coming. And so when we talk about the difference between regulations and Title IX, right? Like, so Title IX is the language of the law. It's only 40 something words, right? No person on the basis of sex, blah, 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 blah. So it says there, there can't be sex discrimination, but it doesn't tell us who, what, when, where, or how we do that. That's what these regulations are. The regulations tell you how you enforce that law, uh, the processes you have to have, you know, who are the stakeholders, who are the players, what are the requirements? Um, so that's the difference between those two and that's how they're connected. So we're waiting for those to drop. Um, what I suspect is that the um, federal government at the same time will include when those final regulations are released, um, a compliance date. Um, when this happened, in 2020, the compliance date was in August. So we got them in May. We had to have new policies written and implemented at our institutions by August. Um, it could be as early as August or um, kind of the longest term scenario might be like a January one. Um, so institutions would go back for their spring term with new policies in place. Um, what does that mean for colleges and universities? It means we will be frantically reading what is likely to be thousands of pages um, of legal regulations. Um, I have three uh, four inch binders that are filled with printed, right? The last printed regs because I had to flag and highlight and underline. And uh, that's the old school lawyer in me, right? To make the absolute mess of all the school supplies I can get my hands on. Um, but it's thousands of pages. So we'll start by reading, processing, um, really understanding what are the changes? What are the differences between this iteration of the law and the last? Um, and then institutions will be at work writing new policies and procedures. Um, because the other piece that institutions have to navigate is not only is there this federal regulatory guidance, but all institutions are subject to their state laws. So state laws may look very similar to this new regulatory guidance, or they may look very different. 
um, the last round of regulations that came out was very different than a lot of state laws, which meant that institutions had to write two different sets of policies and two different sets of procedures in order to check all of those boxes. So my guess is between June and August 1st, you know, June 1 and August 1, your Title IX coordinator and your uh, rulemaking team or your, you know, panel team or uh, conduct team or whoever that is, um, send them donuts, send them coffee, send them flowers, send them kind wishes, um, because they will be writing new policies. And then come first year orientation, um, now it's time to educate all the students on this new process. So they'll be retraining staff, they'll be retraining investigators, uh, all of the different folks that the law will require be involved in this process, who we don't even know who they are yet, um, are gonna have to get trained. So um, it's quite the shuffle. So once those regs release, you will see, yeah, the Title IX folks in your world will just be running <laughs> all over the place. Send them Starbucks. <laughs> Starbucks Please. gift cards. I think yes. it would be yes. highly uh, in demand. And let the record reflect that I am honored to know you and I am so proud of the work that you are doing. It is uh, just really critical work and uh, we need good people like you to help us to understand what all those regulations are and then what changes we need to make on our college campuses all across the country. So I am just uh, just really grateful that uh, that you're here and you're you're going to be ready to help us. <laughs> That's all I can oh, say. Oh yeah. <laughs> all right. So you know I do love New York. Uh, you know I'm born and bred uh, New Yorker and. Uh, we do love good food here at the Fraternity Foodie Podcast, which is no secret to anybody. So when you're in Schenectady, New York, where do you go for a great meal? <laughs> I got to love a deli, right? With last name like Simeoli. I can't yeah. not be a deli gal. Um, I would go Gershon's Deli in Schenectady. I think it's the best um, in the area. There's mm -hmm. some drama and conflict. People may disagree, but that's my pick. Um, but... I love a deli. So, and Schenectady yeah. is not doing us wrong uh, with yeah. their deli selection. So yeah. New York deli selections there in Schenectady are very good. I mean, I don't know if it's quite on par with the New York city delis. I, you know, there's a couple of New York city that are going to give you a run for the money. That's all I'm going to say. Sure. For sure. <laughs> well, in New York city, they're going to have all the, all the really good stuff, but I will say like, you know, you know, it's going to be a good sandwich when like the person at the counter is like, you want the imported stuff. Right. And I'm like, you know, of course I do. That's yeah. Right. So <laughs> my God, nice. you know, what's up. So always <laughs> delicious, always a delight. Oh, this is so great. I love this conversation. It's been fantastic. So if students or administrators who are listening to you right now, if they want to connect with you for consulting opportunities revolving around Title IX or speaking opportunities on their college campus, where should they go to connect with you? Yeah, so um, probably the easiest way to get in touch with me, um, you can either reach out. Mike, I'm going to throw you under the bus. Folks can reach out to you and get connected to me. Or if folks want to send me an email at M as in Mary, F as in Francis, Simioli, S-I-M-E-O-L-I -E at gmail.com, M-F Simioli at gmail.com um, with M-F Simioli Consulting. So that'll come right to me um, and I can help figure out what you need or what you're afraid of or what we got to do because there's a lot coming up for sure. So happy to help and connect with anyone who's interested. Fantastic. You're not throwing me under the bus at all. You're a great friend and <laughs> glad to help you out in any way that I absolutely can. So absolutely reach out by email or connect with me. I'd be more than happy to connect you to Mary um, and make sure you get the help that you need, because ultimately this is all for the college students um, and uh, making our campuses just a, a safer place. So uh, we appreciate it, Mary. You are a godsend. You are an absolute treasure. <laughs> Thank you for the work that you do. Thank you. Thanks for having me, Mike. You got it. And to our listeners, if you enjoyed this conversation with Mary, please like it. Please share it with other college students, other college administrators that need to hear all of this critical information. And we hope to see you on another episode of the Fraternity Foodie Podcast. Thanks so much for joining us. We're going to see you next time. 